and other, and some are more practiced at it than others. And a whole category of people that we don't always think of when we're walking outside are, are musicians. And they're makers, in my mind, of the highest order because not only do they make something out of nothing, but they work together to make something that's bigger than all of them. And we're really lucky, yeah, thank you. Yeah. We're really lucky today, um, a couple months ago, while we were uh, traveling around the area looking to see what was interesting, I had an opportunity to, to go to Cranbrook uh, Institute. And while I was up there, I met James Crowletto, who is going to be doing a lot of the talking tonight. And uh, when I learned that there was a there was a group of artists who got together to explain <coughs> physics and science and music. I got really excited, and I thought this would be one of the real marquee moments of this Maker Fair in Detroit. It's something that we don't have at all in Silicon Valley. So um, they're setting up. They're going to be ready in two or two two fingers. And uh, <laughs> uh, what, the way it's going to work is uh, I'm after, they're going to introduce themselves and they're going to take us through a lecture. Uh, they're going to ask at the end of at the end or during the course of it, they're going to ask you guys some questions. And then at the end, if there's any time left over, there might be some time for you guys to ask the artist questions that I'm sure you'll have. Um, and uh, with that, uh, let me turn it over. So uh, James, well, James and. Uh, Linda Boston of the Arts League of Michigan will introduce all the musicians, and I'm going to sit back and enjoy it with you guys. So thank you very much. All right, I'll bring the lights up. Well, thank you very much. Whoa, here we are. Uh, my name is James Coletto, I work at the Cranbrook Institute of Science, and uh, like, was, like we just were explaining, we're going to have several musicians up here who are just finishing setting up, and this is sort of an interesting blend of the science, which uh, I'll be taking on here, and the music, which these musicians will have, and we've been going out to high schools throughout Detroit for the past half year or so, uh, and presenting this, matching up with their own curriculum. So this is sort of an interesting venue for us, something a little different. We hope you'll enjoy it. And like I said, uh, at the end, we'll, we'll provide some time for some questions, for some feedback, uh, or anything else that you'd like to bring up at that time. So if we could bring the screen down now and get the projection going. <coughs>
glad to be here. Uh, like I said, we're going to have some music, and I'm going to try to explain some of the science behind the music. So we're going to start out very simple here. We're going to start out with the question, what is sound? First of all, sound can be music, like we've been hearing right now. If you don't like how it sounds, we might just call it noise. Yeah. And even as I'm speaking, I'm producing sound as well. So sound can take many forms, but just what is it? Well, if you remember high school, or if it's uh, not reached high school yet, or if it's been a while, we might have to do a little refresher here. Sound is a compressional wave of energy, which is simply an oscillation of pressures through a medium. Oh, that's too much information. Oh, okay. well, we, we can try to break that down for you a bit. But, but, sorry, it's, it's Saturday, we're relaxing. Let's start, let's start simple. We'll start with the idea that sound is energy. Did you bring some energy with you here today? Yeah. Let me see your energy. Show us, show us your energy. So energy can take many forms. It can be a light, it can be chemical energy, it can be thermal energy. Sound is just one type of energy. And it needs some sort of medium, some sort of matter to travel through, as, as we well know. Right now, sound is traveling through the gas, through the air uh, surrounding us to reach your eardrums, which eventually sends an electrical impulse to your brains, which you interpret as sound. But sound can also travel through liquids or solids as well. Uh, if we went out in outer space, of course, in a vacuum of outer space, we would not be able to hear a thing because there's no medium, no matter for the sound to travel through. Say what? No, so you're talking about, uh, this is crazy, because when you're at the show and you see these movies with all this booming and banging and all that carrying on in outer space, that's not real? No, it's Hollywood. That's Hollywood swing. Yeah, so if, if there is no medium, if there is no matter, sound cannot travel. But sound travels in a special way. Sound travels in waves. And we're going to talk about two different types of waves here. The first one we're familiar with, if you've ever been uh, on, at the ocean or at a lake where waves are traveling up and down, yet they're moving towards the shore, you're familiar with one type of wave called a transverse wave. In fact, we could even demonstrate this for them if we imagine that we're at Comerica Park on this fine afternoon. So the oscillation of the matter was perpendicular to the direction of the wave. That was a transverse wave. And if you remember again high school physics or even middle school physics, you might remember that we have different names for different parts of the wave. If we go to the highest point of the wave, that's the crest. The lowest point, the trough. We measure how high a wave is, we call that the amplitude. We measure the distance between two wave patterns, that's the wavelength. Makes sense. Now what does this have to do with all these musicians up here? Well, these musicians rely on something that uh, they know of, and we know of, as frequency. When each musician plays, they produce their own frequency. And what frequency does is it measures how many wave patterns are traveling past the point uh, per second. So usually we measure it in hertz, how many wave patterns per second. So each of these musicians need to know something about the frequency that their instruments produce in order to hit the right tone, hit the right note, to be in tune there. So, first type of wave is transverse, but sound does not travel in transverse waves. Sound actually travels in a second type of wave that we call compressional waves. If you've ever been sitting at a stoplight, or maybe this is even your own car, and you have the bass turned all the way up, and you get that loud bass sound going, you can actually feel these compressional waves traveling through your body. I'm compressing some of these air molecules around me closer to, together, these compressions up here. And that, that of course, causes others to be further apart, uh, further apart, these rarefactions between the compressions. So when they hit your eardrums, you interpret that 
as sound. We could do it on a larger scale, like with the bass drum that Galen has. Or we could even bring out uh, sort of a, a small homemade air, air cannon, we could say, made out of a trash can with a tarp stretched over the end and a hole on the bottom. Well, we could try it uh, out here in the front row. I don't, I don't know if we'll be able to reach it, but we'll see. Uh, so if we just give it a punch, just like the bass drum, let's see if we can cause some compressional waves. Oh, you want to see? All right. Oh, that's this young man. Is, uh, okay. Both go. All right. Come on. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's trying to hurt, right? So right there, let's just, let's just try to give it a, a punch here. Let's see if we can get uh, a little change to happen here, a little bit of... Uh, Energy traveling towards you through a compression. Here we go. There we go. With the air cannon. Here, young man, you can try it as well. Let's give it a push. <laughs> you can actually feel the compressions of the air. Thank you very Thank much. You. Give him a hand. Give him a hand. So it's simple to do, do it yourself there, Project. Uh, air can really causes you to feel those compressional waves of sound energy in your body. And what we're going to do now is we're going to measure these compressions. We're going to bring up uh, some software, an instrument called an oscilloscope. And with that, we can measure the compression. Sound travels in a compressional wave. I want you to remember that. We're going to quiz you at the end. So we're going to measure these compressions uh, with each instrument here. And we're going to display it, visualize it on the screen here with our oscilloscope. So let me switch over here. Turn it on. There we go. All right, a little hard to, to visualize. Can you see it back there? All right, we can lower the lights. There you go. All right. Well, we're going to start with Ibrahim on bass. So if we could bring the spotlight over to the bass. is starting with vibrations. As Ibrahim plucks each string, it's causing it to vibrate, which causes the air around it to compress together. And we can measure these compressions here. Now a bass is a very low instrument. So we should see these waves of sound far apart. So we would have a low frequency, a long wavelength. You can see that there. How about if we shorten a string on the bass? the waves get close together, a shorter wavelength means a higher frequency. If we lengthen the string, longer wavelength, lower frequency. Alright, well done. Give it up for your name. Percussive instruments. Well, one of them is a, is a real percussion instrument this time around. Uh, but we're going to start with the obvious percussion instrument, and that is going to be uh, Galen on drums. Hello, everybody. Yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the way my drum scale works. Um, a long time ago, before this modern drum kit came into being, the drums were made in Africa by trees, basically. Um, nowadays they're made uh, by, you know, you have fiberglass, some drums are fiberglass, some drums are still wood. Um, but the way that they made them was they would cut these trees down into different sizes. And if you wanted a high sound, you have a small size, and a big sound, you want to get a low size. And they would take an animal skin, stretch it over the top of the drum. But before they did that, they had to make the inside empty. They had to make the make the inside of the tree trunk hollow. Because if it wasn't hollow, and you just put a drum head over a solid tree trunk, it's just going to sound like this. No air is going to be able to pass through. No vibration is going to happen. So they had to make it hollow, so that when you hit it, the skin would vibrate, and the vibration would cause air to pass through the hole, and to make sounds to sound more like this. 
So that's how my drums work. And if you want a high sound, as I said, you must have a small drum because if you try to tune a big drum and to get a high sound, you're going to just break the head because you won't be able to get it tight enough. And the same with a, a, high, a low sound, you won't be able to get a low sound on a high drum because it's too small and, the, and the, vi the vibrations are faster. So you won't be able to get a low sound no matter how low you tune it. So that's how my drum set works. So I'm, I'm going to show you my amplitude and my wave rate. <laughs> so I'm directing tra air traffic. <laughs> I'm going to show you that first. I'm going to show you, uh, well, at the same time, I'm going to show you my wavelength, starting with the, the bass drum. And I'm also going to show you my amplitude, which is also the frequency or the hardness of what I hit, which I hit the drum. So I'm going to start soft. So the, high, the harder I hit the drum, the higher my amplitude gets. And you can see my wavelength on this drum is wide. And try this drum. The wavelength is a little shorter because it's a smaller drum. You see this drum. And the wavelength is a little shorter on that one because it's a smaller sound, a higher sound. Let's see what it all sounds like together. instrument, but today we're going to simulate it electronically, so that's going to be Pam on keyboards. Hi, everybody. Hi, Pam. How are you today? Hi, Pam. <laughs> well, what makes this really neat? Well, I'm kind of mad because it's not real piano, so I have to do a simulation, which I get tired of. But anyway, it's percussive as well as harmonic. Now, if you looked inside a real piano, which I'm sure many of you have, you know, just taken them apart. If you look inside of it, it's encased in wood, you see a lot of brass, you see a lot of steel, and you see a lot of keys, and what's really neat is like, you'll see the key is hooked up to this wooden plank, it's hooked up to a metal clip, and when you strike the key, it hits these strings, and makes the string vibrate to produce the sound. Now, just similar to Ibrahim's bass and other string instruments you see, the thicker the string, the lower the sound, the thinner the string, the higher the pitch. So, so that, striking, that striking on that string is what makes it a percussive instrument. Yep, As yep. And you can try this too with your head. You can hold your mouth open and go, ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know how you used to do that. Yeah, so, you know oh, <laughs> okay, so <laughs> anyway, I'm going to see what my amplitude and my waveform looks like. So if I get a high note. Ooh, that's really squeaky, isn't it? Squeaky. If I get a lower note. what they all sound like together. And I think the piano is such a lovely instrument, everyone should play it. <laughs> Sound. 
Uh, now we're really going to see the frequency, the changes in frequency, and what that means for the wave patterns up here. We're going to have a wind instrument this time, a brass instrument, and that's John on trumpet. Thanks, James. How's everybody doing? Oh, yeah. I can't really see anybody, but I want you to do something with me. I want you to form your lips as if you're about to say the letter M. Okay, now keep the corners of your mouth tight and blow air through the middle. All right, that's how. <laughs> That's the vibration that's going to get everything going to make a sound on a trumpet, okay? Okay? So you uh, vibe, buzz your lips into the mouthpiece. The mouthpiece focuses the, the vibration into the horn. The air column is stuck inside the horn begins to oscillate, and then you hear a, a tone produced. Uh, the trumpet is pretty loud, and, um, and uh, it's actually the, the soprano voice of the brass family. So uh, if that holds true to what we're going to witness on the oscilloscope, we should see uh, very high amplitude and um, shorter wavelengths. Now, 
But she pay attention to this. It's going to be real cool. We're getting ready to make a real pretty kitchen. Okay, here I go. Here I come. She's be coming in the top now. On the side. Here I am. I'm making my way. It's green. Here comes the green. She's coming from the other end. constructive interference. The waves would become higher, there'd be a greater amplitude. So if two waves are exactly in sync, they're in phase with the crest of one wave lining up with the crest of the other wave, same wavelength, then we will have constructive interference, an amplification, a louder sound. However, we can also have destructive interference. And in fact, we're experiencing this right now in some parts of this auditorium, where if we have two waves of the same frequency that are exactly out of sync, out of phase, where the crest of one wave lines up with the trough of the other, then they could cancel each other out. And that's how those noise-canceling headphones work. They produce a second sound by picking up uh, on all the sounds around it, and by producing a wave that's completely out of phase, it can cancel out the sounds around you. You can hear a much quieter environment around you. And of course, even musicians rely on uh, interference, the compression in the recording studio as well. All right, so what we're going to do is touch upon one more feature of sound, and that is resonance. And to introduce resonance, we'll show you a short movie clip of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, very famous uh, in the examples of resonance. I just read an article a couple weeks ago. Maybe house lights now for this one? Oh, if we can bring down the house lights. Yeah. 
Uh, that some scientists are looking at this, that there were other factors besides resonance, but bridges have been sort of infamous throughout their history. Don't march in step over a bridge where bad things could happen. Frequency of that wine glass. If we manage to hit just that right frequency, we add energy uh, to this wine glass at just the right time, we can get that wine glass to oscillate further and further. Uh, now, I, I will say this. We're not going to attempt to break it in here because if, if we did, uh, we probably also damage your ears as well. To break a wine glass, it takes a little more effort uh, than some of those old commercials might. Yeah, you, in fact, you you parents out here, you remember the Elephants General commercial, the Memorex commercial years ago? You yeah. hit that high E, and she broke back. Yeah, that's what we're going to do today. But we're not going to break it though. <laughs> we'll try. We'll give it our best shot. We're, we're going to make any promises. We're going to fake. Really rely on the flaws within the glass uh, when the glass is formed uh, to to have one that would actually break. So we'll do our best here, but let's see if we can at least get it to, to move resonate right. during our last song. Okay. And maybe the house lights down one more time so we can see the screen. Yeah. Okay. Frequency measures what? Is it A, the amount of energy in a sound wave? 
B, the number of crests in a wave, or C, the number of waves per second. Number Raise your hand if it's A, the amount of energy in a sound wave. Raise your hand. Raise your hand if it's B, the number of crests in a wave. Raise your hand if it's C, the number of waves per second. Whoa! What's the answer, sir? The answer is C. You got Ooh. it. Hey, 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 hey. All right, third question. We're halfway, to, halfway through here. Uh, the louder the sound, the higher the what? Is it A wavelength, B amplitude, or C truck? All right, raise your hand if it's A wavelength. Raise your hand if it's B amplitude. Raise your hand if it's C truck. Oh, what's the answer, Mr. Dean? The correct answer is B amplitude. Amplitude, <laughs> amplitude, amplitude, amplitude. All right, doing well. Next question: When two waves are amplified uh, due to kind of interference. What do we call this? Is it A, constructive interference, B, destructive interference, or C, radio interference? Thank you, Van. Raise your hand if it's A, constructive interference. Raise your hand if it's B, destructive interference. Raise your hand if it's C, radio interference. What is the answer, Mr. Dean? The correct answer is A, constructive interference. All right, make your hand. Thank you, Van. Thank you, Van. All right, last question here, and uh, if we can get this one, I would be very impressed. Uh, uh, that last video that we showed you here, when those wind gusts caused the Tacoma Narrows Bridge to uh, collapse, this was an example of what? Was it A, interference, B, frequency, or C, resonance? Raise your hand if it's A, interference. Raise your hand if it's B, frequency. Raise your hand if it's C, resonance. Mr. James, look at that! Uh, yes, they did it very well. The correct answer was C, resonance. <laughs> same principle, the uh, mechanism for vibration would be different. So on a saxophone or woodwinds, for example, even though a saxophone is made mostly out of the same material as a trumpet, there's a little piece of wood called a reed, and, and it's attached and you're blowing over the reed, and the reed is vibrating. So it's producing a, a different tone. And on an instrument like the flute, you're blowing across a hole, almost as like uh, blowing over across a, a pop bottle or uh, 
to produce the tone, you know, like so, or whistling. So just, you know, if you produce the sound a different way, it will just have a different timbre, but they still have really the same principle. And, and, and to add to that, there's also different amounts of hair, of course, as well, the difference between a saxophone and a flute. Obviously, there's a larger hair column within, uh, for instance, the saxophone. So get that to resonate, they'll, they'll resonate at a lower frequency, with a bigger, bigger hair column inside that, that instrument. This young man way back there has a question. Oh, okay. Oh, no, All she right. has one right here. Oh, well, we'll go ahead. It's been raising his hand for a while here. Come on, Ben. Go ahead. How does the drum work? Oh, how does the drum work? I'm, I, I think Galen might be able to take that one. Good question. The question was, how does the, how does the drum work? Is that what the question Yes, was? yes. The drum works. Um, it has a it has a body, a hollow body. It usually is either made out of wood, or in this case, my drum said it's made out of fiberglass. There's a plastic drum head that is tightened, stretched over the top of the hole, and then when I hit it, the drum head vibrates. And when it vibrates, the air passes through this hole to produce sound. So if there's no hole, it doesn't, there's no sound. It sounds like this. And with the hole, the sounds. The air can pass through, and it'll resonate. This hole will make it resonate. The, vib the head vibrates, and the hole makes it resonate, so you can get sound. So the air is coming out of that bottom of that drum to and resonating to make that sound. Yeah, kind of like the big drum that uh, James had when he hit it. The air, the air blew people's hair back. But this this operates on the same principle. I just want to know You're the name of your fantabulous band. You guys are awesome. Where can we come? Where can we buy your album? Where can we see you perform? Are you guys on uh, American Idol or America's Got Talent? I mean, you guys are great. Thank you. We actually may violate an age uh, problem with American Idol. Uh, they, they don't. They don't. I do. <laughs> No, uh, we are actually the Artology Band, and we work for, with Artology and the Cranbrook Arts League of Michigan Collaborative. However, each one of us uh, has, its, uh, have, has their own band or uh, live performance opportunities. Gaylin, share where you play. Everybody share where you play and what you're doing this time to perform that, that gig. Well, um, <laughs> on Fridays, I'm actually playing with a, a man named Alan Barnes down at the Whitney. Um, on Lord and Canfield, we, we put out a nice terrace uh, outside, really nice, from 7 to 10 every Friday. And then you can look at me, look for me with a group called Straight Ahead or Marcus Belgrave as well. Hello, I'm. Is all? Yes, it's all you mean. I'm Ibrahim, the bass player group. You can find me um, Monday nights at the Jazz Loft for some great time with Milton Hill. Wednesday night, I'm with uh, Scott Covington at the Harbor House. And actually, I perform with John's group on Fridays at first. And um, we are toward different people and also teach. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. what Us. Hi, I'm Pam. And um, you'll oh, see man. me performing a lot of times. Galen performs in my group. I perform in her group. Ibrahim performs in my group. John sometimes performs with me. Um, I'll be at the Detroit Jazz Fest on uh, September the 4th, and I'll be doing the, um, um, what you call it, uh, the, the Arts Beats and Eats. And who's your husband, Pamela? His name is Wendell Harrison. He's not here today. today. <laughs> well, we all have CDs and recordings of me. You can find us on iTunes, CD Baby, and John Green Book. He's everywhere. Yeah, I'm everywhere. I'm at Bert's. I'm going to double dip on Bert's at Eastern Market if you're on uh, Friday night. We go late at 3 a.m. Sun Messengers. Uh, Sun Messengers. You can go ahead and check out the website, uh, www.sunmessengers.com. And uh, check out the calendar. We do quite a few things on the different communities. Maybe, uh, and uh, official band of the uh, Detroit Pistons. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, today, this afternoon, in uh, it's like an hour and 15 minutes, we'll be at. Uh, <laughs> At the Motor City Casino. All right. And then I'm, I'm an actor. You probably see me in film or on stage more than anything else. I, you know, I performed for Menopause Musical for about five years. And then I'm working on a CD with Randy Scott uh, called Permission. It's an inspirational jazz CD. Give me some more time to get it out. We're working on it right now. The last film that you probably see me produced in was uh, Butterfly Effect 3. 
uh, crossover, high school, uh, street kings with Ray Liotta, we just shot finish. I just finished shooting with him last week. So yeah, so come see us. Go to LindaBoston.com so you can see everything I'm doing. Any other questions out here? Anyone? Got one? A little Yes, I will come to you, Doc. Oh, how do microphones work, Mr. James and Miss Gaylin and Miss Pamela? That's a good question. Very good question. That's a very good question. Yeah. Uh, traditional <laughs> microphones, I believe, have a membrane inside of them. Oh, thank you. All right, here we go. That uh, pick up those vibrations, and they're able to turn it into, like we were seeing up here in the oscilloscope, something electronic. So it can take something that's physical, these compressional waves of energy, transmit it into something electronic which goes through wireless signals here in this case or through uh, through the wires and then when they reach the speakers which uh, we have around here you can't see them uh, behind the mesh there then it gets transmitted translated back into something that we can hear with each push of the cone of the speaker sends out those compressional waves again until it reaches our ear so it, it all has something to do with capturing these vibrations, translating it into something that can be communicated through the mixers, through the amplifiers, and then back out to the speakers through your ears. Now, is that similar to when we were kids and we would put two cans and a string between them and stretch them and talk into a can and you, the vibration of the string, you could hear it on the other end? So you've got to try that example with her when you get home. Okay, that'd be wonderful. Okay, you got another question, baby? Agency. How does the trumpet work, Mr. John? Did he leave? Uh, no. he okay. <laughs> How does the trumpet work? Formulas is if you're about to say the letter M. Mm. Say mmm. <laughs> oh. mm. Can you hear it? And then keep the corners of your lips tight. But uh, and blow air through the middle, the center part, uh, like so. There you go. Now, if you do that into a mouthpiece and you do it just right, you have to do it just right. It's not. Nice. There you go. If you do that, you you might be a, a trombone or two. Up there I see Miles Davis too. <laughs> Get that damn trombone. All right. <laughs> Any other questions? You got questions? I'm talking on American Idol, um, like the age limit was like. 20-something? So, we're 21. No. <laughs> very good, very good. Thank you all for joining us. Enjoy the rest of Mr. Fair. We have a great time with you. Thank you very much, and uh, I've just been talking to James, and we'll try and get a list of all the recordings and performances on the Make the Makezine blog which uh, uh, I don't know if everybody knows, but Meg has a blog called MegScene, MegScene.com, and we'll get a list of all that up on the blog in the next couple of days. So thank you very much. This was a really special treat. <laughs>